Chapter 6 I looked like a cottage, with my doughy face peeking out from under the roof. Hundreds of people were going to see me, and I looked even uglier than I truly was. I sat on the bed. I couldn't stop crying, although I knew the Duchess was waiting. She barged in. A cat rode on her shoulder. Until then I had never seen her laugh, but now she tittered. The titters turned to gales, then shrieks of laughter. Not laughing at you, she had to the grace to gasp out. The bonnet! I couldn't laugh along. I waited her out. When she recovered, she allowed me to wear a different headdress. She told me she had something that would do. She left and returned, holding a grey cap with a single grey feather. I never thought I'd wait on a servant, she said, handing it to me. The cap was better. The gown was still absurd, but I was no longer quite so conspicuous. After I helped her dress, we joined the crowd trooping through the castle corridors. I shortened my stride to the Duchess's mincing steps. Enough people stared at me to make me wish myself back in my room. I thought of my family. If I missed the wedding, so would they. We finally reached the Hall of Song, which I had heard of for as long as I could remember. Oaken pillars supported an oaken ceiling. Each pillar was a wooden, elongated singer whose lines and features had been softened by the centuries. Suspended from the ceiling, a wooden singer flew, her lips forming an O. A living lark perched on her left hand. Its song, clear and fine, was enhanced by the hall's legendary acoustics. The seats were arranged in a three-quarter circle facing the stage. The Duchess's rank commanded a seat in the first row. I was on her right. Everyone was standing, and we stood, too. A tiny man with bushy eyebrows stood between the stage and the seats. He held a baton, so I knew he must be Sir Ulu, the Antio choir master, the most respected person in Iosa after the king. A flutist waited next to Sir Ulu, who raised his baton. The flutist began to play. Everyone hummed along with the flute. Under the cover of the other voices, I alluised, so that my humming came from the mouth of the wooden singer overhead. I was certain no one would hear me, but the choir master looked up. My heart almost flew out of my mouth. I stopped alluising. King Oscaro and Prince Joy and a large black boarhound stepped through the wine-red velvet curtains at the back of the stage. I knew the king by his crown and the prince by his dog. Every Eorthian knew about the prince and his faithful hound, Uchu. Prince Joy was only seventeen, but he was taller than his uncle, the king. He had his uncle's rounded cheeks and narrow chin. He was handsome, very handsome, but for over-large ears. I liked those ears. They were whimsical. They were charming. The prince's expression was solid, but I detected a gleam in his eye. Then I saw Uchu lick a tidbit out of his hand. The hand moved to the pocket of his tunic, and the dog got another treat. The king was smiling, and I saw why everyone loved him. His smile was so sweet and kindly. King Oscaro was said to have the best heart in the kingdom. I believed it. He stepped to the edge of the stage while Prince Ajoy and Uchu moved to the side. A latecomer, a middle-aged woman wearing a gold tiara, crossed in front of me to reach her place three seats away. I wondered if she was Princess Eleni, the prince's mother, the king's sister. I sensed eyes on me. I glanced up, and it was the prince. I felt my blotchy blush begin. I saw myself in my mind's mirror. Blushing made me as garish as blood on snow. I felt the duchess turn. I turned, too, as the bride entered the hall. The flutist missed a measure. Everyone's humming faltered. The duchess stiffened. Nearly pretty. She was ravishing. The tailor's cousin needed new eyes. My own eyes could barely take her in. Vivi was only a few inches shorter than I, but she was fragile, almost insubstantial. Her honey-colored hair shone as though a bit of sunlight was caught in each strand. Her skin seemed to glow from within like porcelain. Her bones, in her cheeks, her jaw, her wrists, were more finely shaped than the stem of a crystal goblet. She and I could have belonged to different species. She was ethereal, and I was base. I'd been a fool to imagine the slightest connection between us. She advanced in measured steps as the ceremony required. Her expression was serious. Her gaze was on King Oscaro, 
except for a peek round the hall. She saw our astonishment and flashed a smile, of triumph, I thought, and then became serious again. She joined King Oscaro on the stage, and we took our seats. Sir Ulu, the choir master, sang, King Oscaro! The whole wedding would be sung, of course. Yes, Deotha! King Oscaro's bass voice was full and rich. Sir Ulu sang, Made Ivy! Ivy coughed. The flutist missed another measure. Ivy whispered, Yes, Deotha! Several people groaned. Everyone pitied her for losing her voice on her wedding day, but we felt fear as well as pity. This was unlucky. This boded ill. At home in Amanta, a sore throat was cause enough to postpone a wedding, but a royal wedding, I supposed, with so many dignitaries attending, couldn't be postponed. Sir Ulu turned to face us. He sang, Eotheana! We sang, Yes, Eotha! After that, Sir Ulu sang that this was a marriage of three, King Oscaro, Ivy, and Eotha. The maiden who married the king also married the kingdom, and the kingdom married her. Sir Ulu likened king, queen, and country to the three tree, which grew only in Eotha. The three tree wasn't one tree, but three, the white obroco, the red almena, and the black-barked umbra. Their trunks grew no more than an inch apart, and their roots and branches mingled. Sir Ulu began the three tree song, also known as the song de Orsa. Everyone joined in. The wind weaves through you, my three tree. Your leaves wet lost, wish with for sigh. Ye you shall to ye did the axel bansu. In ye who lova, who sorrow over his happy, as ye feel me a force. I'd sung the song of Eortha hundreds of times, but never with the king. I wanted to remember everything. The smell of the courtier's perfume, the king's joy, the bride's beauty, and her whisper, the prince's ears, his dog, the birds trilling, the singing statues. The wind whips through you, my three tree, your branches sway, whoosh whistle blow. Ye yu sha su kuk du axel bansu. In ye who hu a loba, who sorrow if o go a ha hu, who tsiki o yu li tsiki. My o ba go high and sweet de yortha. My a main a mellow and light de yortha. My o mbu dark and deep de yortha. The king sang his wedding song, declaring the reasons he loved his bride. She makes me laugh and cry. I reflect her glow and believe that I am glowing too. To please her for a minute pleases me for a week. She has thunder and lightning, rage and joy. She breathes in the highness and exhales the low. She wakes me up and makes me sing. Ivy smiled. She touched her throat and was silent. After the ceremony, the Duchess and I joined a receiving line in the corridor outside the Hall of Song. Perhaps fifty people were ahead of us. The line started to move. The Duchess stepped forward. I hung back. Aza! Feeling rising panic, I moved up. I shielded my face with my hand. I hadn't expected to meet the king and the queen and the prince. If I'd known, I'd have thrown myself out of the coach on the way here. Peeking between my fingers, I saw Prince Ejori, with Uchu at his feet, greet the guests and announce their names. The Duchess and I moved up again. I tried to reason myself out of my fear. Everyone would be polite. The king and queen would be too caught up with each other to pay attention to me. The prince would be too occupied with announcing the guests. I concentrated on the royal couple and the prince, attempting to prepare myself. The king and queen's love for each other was unmistakable. She leaned into him and clung as tightly as real ivy. He beamed at her and looked prouder than an Eorthian lyrebird. As I watched, 
Izzy's expression turned impish, oh, so adorably impish. She touched her husband's cheek and whispered in his ear. For a moment he looked discomfited. Then he exploded into laughter, and she looked vastly pleased with herself. Feeling I was intruding by watching them, I looked instead at the prince, who cocked his head in a doggy way when a guest spoke to him. He traded witticisms with the guest. He seemed to have a light heart and a clever tongue. When a guest reached the king, he held her hand or put his arm around her shoulder. If he whispered, thank you, to each one. I couldn't hear, but I could read her lips. She smiled the same smile each time, too. Brilliant, but automatic and lacking warmth. Nothing like the smiles she'd bestowed on her husband. I grew desperate. Only a dozen people were ahead of us. Most guests spoke their congratulations, but some sang a verse of their own composition. One guest had a flawless high soprano. She wasn't as beautiful as the queen, but she was a beauty, dark-skinned with a face of gentle curves. She sang, Congratulations! May your voices mingle long and late. The duchess whispered, We expected the king to marry Lady Aruna, who would have been a much better match, and we wouldn't have had such an inauspicious wedding either if Aruna had been the bride. Not necessarily. Lady Arona might have had a sore throat, too. Long and late, may your double life spin a single melody. If his smile faded, she smoothed a stray lock of gray hair behind the king's ear. She was demonstrating her claim to him. She was jealous. Of joy forever, of joy forever, of joy forever. King Oscaro patted Izzy's hand. Now I was jealous. The gesture was so loving. No one would ever pat my hand that way. He spoke loud enough for me to hear. Thank you, Lady Arona. Your good wishes can hardly fail to come true. He paused and then burst out. Arona, is my Izzy not a wonder? He turned to Izzy. My dear, you are always lovely, but tonight you outshine the stars. Ivy looked smug. Lady Arona seemed to take the king's remarks with good grace. She curtsied and started off down the corridor. Four people now separated the Duchess and me from the prince. Your grace? I said. Yes? I forgot. What could I have forgotten? I forgot my handkerchief. I'd better fetch it. I'll... Nonsense. I'm not going to wait. You didn't... How dare you interrupt me? Two people remained before us. Your Grace, I can't stay. Let me go. I must go. She understood. Don't be silly. I didn't bring a companion in order to be alone. She stepped closer to the prince. I followed her. I was uglier than a hydra. I was as big as the corridor. There was nothing to look at but me. Prince Azuri announced the Duchess. I stood frozen. She stepped forward. Congratulations, sire. Congratulations, your majesty. I hope you'll be very happy. I didn't move. I stared at the floor. My blush was as red as raw meat. The duchess said, Aza, the king is waiting.